Heavily processed foods, typically bad for you. They promote overeating. Okay. Basically, they make you fat. Now, here's the deal. You can't totally avoid them. Are there processed foods that are better than others? Yes. Here's the mo most important thing you should consider. Find heavily processed foods that are very high in protein. That'll help mitigate the effects of heavily processed foods. It'll help you not overeat them, and at least it's gonna help you hit your protein targets. Two trigger warnings in one intro. That's Why? not bad. Uh, well, you said fat, and then you said that bad food. Those oh, are two, yeah. two things that That's will weird. set people off. Right. Right. People don't yeah. like to hear fat anymore. What no, you can't, you can't say it's that. It's a fun anymore. word. Yeah, you can't say that anymore. You're, it makes you out of pussy? Yeah. Wow. Uh, that sounded terrible. Less fit. That sounded less good. fit. <laughs> less, yeah. <laughs> less fit. How about that? Squishy. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, here's the deal. Like, uh, so the 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 main the main problem with heavily processed foods isn't necessarily that they're inherently unhealthy. Um, now, for the most part, they are less healthy than whole natural foods, but that's not really the main issue. The main issue is that they make you overeat. That's just the bottom line, and and they they're really really powerful in this respect. I mean, studies show pretty consistently that people will eat like five or 600 more calories a day, even if macros are controlled, if they eat heavily processed foods. So um, this is a pretty big deal. That's a big deal. That's like, if you're trying to put someone on a bulk uh, or trying to cut someone, typically that's the amount of calories that you work with. But if you can choose a food that's heavily processed, that's mostly protein, then you're going to have um, a better a better chance at not overeating because protein is so... Satiating. So, yes. Yeah. And this is why, by the way, most snack foods, which are all pretty much heavily processed foods, why most snack foods are not uh, protein-based because they don't uh, make as much money. People don't overeat them. Like they do things like potato chips and crackers and Well, I think the biggest consideration here is like if you're traveling, especially if you're like on the freeway yeah. and a long drive and it's like you got gas stations, you got whatever like garbage out there that you have as options. Like I'm always kind of looking for something like a beef jerky or something a little yes. more on that side uh, in, in terms of like a processed option. Yes. Yeah. Well, how do you guys do? Is there like a hierarchy that you tell clients uh, as far as processed foods or is there like certain guidelines that you tell them like you know because it's it's impossible I think for somebody to eat 100% whole natural foods all the time I think it's inevitable that you're going to have a day where you travel a day where you didn't meal prep or the food that you did meal prep it's, now you're it, out of meals it's like, highly improbable for sure yeah it's like I just and so I think what I was always challenging clients is like, let's let's just call a day where you hit your macros and it's all through whole foods is what's is perfect and the goal always. And anything any and for every processed food that comes in there, healthy or not, meaning protein bars, shakes, things like that, it, we're we're starting to get away from what we would consider a hundred percent day. And yes, if that happens occasionally because you were you know on the road or flying or whatever, that's fine. Then we get right back on the wagon the next day, and then we're we're going after it. Yeah, no, I would tell my you you picked the my favorite one, Justin, which is uh, like jerky. You know, um, that is hard to overeat. Mm -hmm. Like, have you ever had a client where you look at their diet and you're like, oh, here's why you're eating too much. You're eating too much jerky. I would never, <laughs> said nobody. Yeah. That would never happen. And you can find jerky nowadays pretty much everywhere. And now there's companies that make really good uh, type of, you know, jerky type. Yeah. Like Paleo Valley has grass fed meat sticks and they're not dry. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are like, I don't like jerky. It's too dry. It's hard to chew or whatever. That never really bothered me, but you know, you try like these grass fed meat sticks and they're like, they're really good. They hit it out the park. Do you yeah. guys remember when, before we partnered with them, like we got sent Epic, we got sent, um, another popular brand, a bunch of, a bunch of companies. Yeah. I don't know. Probably four different, uh, jerky companies. And, and I remember, and Paleo Valley was not the first one. And like, we really wanted to do jerky, but I was like, man, these ones are just, you know, Sal will almost eat anything. So he's like, gets excited right away. Right. Like, Oh, this is good. Everything's good. It's like, is it free? Ah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's, that's <laughs> really, if it's healthy and it's free, those are Sal's qualifications what? right there. <laughs> it's healthy and it's free. Like, Oh, this is so good. It's yeah. like, well, I've had quite a bit better jerky. Yeah, I you know? don't, I don't have the palate. Of but a when a, hey, when, when Peo Valley <laughs> came around and they sent us jerky, I remember everybody was so like, good. Oh damn. Like, you know, what's crazy. Delicious. Too? You know, what's crazy too. They have the, uh, so they have the beef ones and they have the turkey ones. Yes. And I would normally think, like, I'm going to go beef, right? 
The turkey ones I like more. Yeah. Well, the turkey yeah, ones are super flavorful. Well, because it's not like super dried out. Like turkey is always like like just like totally like cardboard kind of meat. It's the for worst me. meat. Yeah, it's like the worst. Yes. And, but somehow they got it to uh they they mastered it where yeah. it's still. Isn't the juicy. turkey one like a like one gram higher in protein too for some reason? A little bit more protein and with a less little less a little, and little less fat. yeah, less calories too, yeah, right? So yeah. it's a little less calories and a little more protein. But yeah, when I travel and even with my kids, um, when I'm packing snacks, because you know, you know, one of the values of processed foods is that they have a long shelf life. They're easy to travel with. You can carry them anywhere. You don't have to refrigerate them. So that's, I'm like meat sticks. If I go somewhere, meat sticks. If I, if my kids need snacks, yep. you know, meat sticks and you're getting protein. It's, it produces satiety. Like if I eat, if I want a snack and I go to a gas station and I get a bag of chips and some candy, I'm not going to feel nearly as satiated as if I eat two meat sticks, mm-hmm. like two meat sticks will be more satisfying to me and it's less calories, more protein. Yeah, what's your thoughts on doing that, even if you're going to do... So, for example, last night, I actually... uh, I was a little low on my calories, so I had room for more calories for the day. Uh, Katrina and I are are watching a movie. Uh, She wants popcorn. I want popcorn. But I have uh, the beef jerky stick first before I eat the popcorn. Yes. I notice a huge difference on the amount of popcorn that I end up eating. You know what's funny? Not to mention I get an extra, you know, whatever it is, 12 or whatever grams of protein. You know what's funny about that? so counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. You're like, I'm going to eat more to eat less. Right. No, like you, you literally are, if you do it first, by the way, this is a trick for just any meal you eat, any meal you eat, if you have your proteins and your carbs and your fats, and sometimes it's the proteins and fats come together, right? So it's like steak or something. If you just eat the protein first, you're probably going to eat less than if you didn't do that in the first yeah. place. If, so I, I, that's what I do with my food. I'll have it all, you know, parsed out and then I'll go just the protein and then I'll leave it. Now, if I'm trying to bulk, it's funny. If I'm trying to bulk, I'll flip it. Or I'll mix it all up because I know I can eat more calories, mm. you know, otherwise I get too, too full. If I eat the big steak first and I move on to the, the rice and stuff, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm choking yeah, it down. Yeah, but if I'm point. trying to maintain a lean body weight, um, then that's what I do. So that's, and I wanted to say that, uh, that, that fit tip, because uh, you're right. It's, it's so hard to avoid processed foods. And then it's like, you know, I'm traveling, like, you know, what am I going to do? Like everybody just thinks nuts. Like mm-hmm. I'll just take nuts with me. Nuts are better than others, but they're not the greatest. You could overdo you get calories, calories really fast. Yeah, yeah, it gets away from you. Yes. Yeah. Well, and then I, I know I say this all the time, like a broken record, but when the FDA allows it to be 20% off and you are doing that once or twice every day for a week, you're talking about 10 to 14 yes. meals that have potential of being 100 to 300 potentially calories off. Like, boy, that really starts to add up for some, and a lot of times, when I and this is and this took me a while to get to this point as a coach, you know, I'd have clients that would report back though, oh, I'm I'm hitting everything. Why am I not why is the scale not moving? Why am I not losing mm-hmm. body fat? And come to find out, you know, it was those two or three meals and just simply maybe going, okay, listen, I, I'm not gonna change anything as far as your macro targets. I just the goal is for the next two weeks, can you give me two weeks of like mm-hmm. no eating out? Just just eat everything you've made yourself and but you can st- exact same amount that were you're supposedly reporting and they always inevitably would would lose and yes. you would see a difference. Yes. And so, you know, that that to me just highlights how far off we can be when you are you're consistently eating packaged processed totally. or out. All right everybody, today's giveaway maps aesthetic. Here's how you can win that program. Leave a comment below this video the first 24 hours that we drop it here on YouTube. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll notify you in the comment section that you won um, that program. Also, we got a sale going on this month. Maps Anabolic and Map Split, both 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Since we're on the topic of health, right? Um, how, do either one of you guys use a snooze button when you wake up in the morning? Anybody in here uh, use a snooze button? No, I, I mean, I hit it and then, uh, so I have the one that like glows, like it's, oh, yeah, it's, yeah. it wakes you up with the light. So I, I kind of, you know, meander, uh, and wait there a bit until like my eyes kind of adjust, but you're but, not doing, but the I'm whole not like hitting it and then waiting for it to, to, I used to though. In. Yeah. I used to a lot. Like, like, um, for sure when I was a trainer and I had to get up at like five o'clock in the morning, which is really early for me. How many times did you snooze? Two or three times. Dude, I just learned something about the snooze button and why it's such a terrible thing to do in the morning. Mm. So you ever notice that when you hit the snooze, so you wake up, uh, you look at the clock, you hit the snooze button, yeah. and then when it goes off nine minutes later, it literally, it's like taking you out of the dead. Like you're like, yeah. oh, ah. like out of an even deeper sleep or yeah. something. Mm-hmm. So here's what happens. There's something called sleep inertia. 
So alarm goes off, you hit the snooze button, you fall right back to sleep very quickly because you still have what's called sleep inertia. But a full sleep cycle takes about 50 to 75 minutes. So you've got to go through the different stages of sleep. Now, one of the stages is what happens kind of before you wake up or when you're supposed to wake up. But the first couple are like this deep sleep. And if you're woken out of them, you're going to feel groggy and shitty. It's going to take longer for you to get back to normal. Mm. So what you're doing is you're going nine minutes into a 50 to 75 minute sleep cycle. So snoozing is terrible. It's totally terrible for your circadian rhythm and how you feel. In the morning. So that's interesting. Yeah. So then why is it, why would they consider like those, those 20 minute power naps so beneficial then? Uh, power, isn't that disrupting that? Different because mm, you're because getting you're into sleep okay. from being awake. Okay. When you, when you're doing this from, when you wake up from a sleep, from, from being at night, you have what's called sleep inertia. You jump right into these, uh, these okay. cycles, but that's also, you ever notice this with yeah. taking a nap? You ever notice you wake up from a 30 minute nap, you're like, cool. You wake up from a nap that's longer. 40, yeah, 40 yeah, minutes. And you, wake, and, and you wake up and you're like, the rest of the day is ruined. That's what they, they, say, they say that 20 to 30 minute is like the sweet yes. spot, right? For like a perfect power nap. Have you, so I've never done this, although I've heard people have tremendous success with laying down for a midday nap because they know they're sleep deprived or whatever. And they take a caffeine pill. Oh, and they wake up from the caffeine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it takes yeah. about 30 minutes yeah. or so for it to hit. And then the caffeine actually wakes them up mm -hmm. and they're like yeah, alert and ready to I've go. I've done that. You got to time it perfectly though. So I've done it to where I'm like, oh, I'm going to take a nap. I take caffeine. And then, then you I got to go do something with the kid. Or <laughs> I go to the bathroom and then, ah, oh, fuck, I missed yeah. it. Yeah, you got to do it perfectly. Yeah, so that's you're, why you're, I've always been afraid to. You're bringing me back to a little like PTSD from um, when I used to live with this guy in the dorm. Like he was like notorious for the snooze. Like he would do it, I'm not even joke, 20 times. Oh, what the hell? And I'm like, you're killing me I, I ended up unplugging it and <laughs> you know a few times and like he'd be like oh i missed my class i'm like tough shit like i'm not gonna sit here and have you like hammer me with snooze like oh man like oh my god i remember like just like almost we would get in fights over it all the time and i'm just like how he had conditioned himself that like he literally had to do it I had over and over and over and There's over a lot of until he like finally got up i had a roommate just like that not only crazy. that but he that was what he did uh, every day. He also had that um, classic alarm one, the, the same, oh. and the, the one that is like the universal like yeah. alarm. So he had that one. And then in addition to that, Ugh. at least one at every five times, he would forget that he snoozed the, you know, the ninth time and then he'd get in the shower. So then it would be going in his room. <laughs> and you can hear it. Yeah, yeah, and I could hear him, this motherfucker. I could hear his shower going. So that is, and I'm like, oh, bro. Yeah, that was a, like, you know, what's totally interesting? brought me back to oh, this thing. So there's this, other, there's this other theory with alarm clock. Because Justin, you have the Slap same alarm him. that I, that I like to use where the way that it works is it, slowly starts to glow. Mm -hmm. And then if you want, you can also add sound to like birds chirping or whatever. Yeah. But the glow will wake you up and you wake up so gently. Like you just, it's almost like you woke up on your own yeah. versus the old school ones where like they do the sound, the real loud sound. Like or the, shock and awe. They just, ah. okay. So, so there's also that this theory where they say that, that, that whatever that sound is that just jolts you out of sleep, you actually develop a little bit of trauma around. Have you guys ever heard, and like right now, if I were to play that old school dude, alarm that sound, will, that actually, it would give you that weird feeling. I'm like, want to fight, chill. dude. Like I, like, I get the chills from it. It bothers me that much. It, you know why, too? Because it's also connected to like my childhood. Yes. Of, like having to get up for school yes. and not wanting to go to school. To be well, so, really, what, what, not getting yeah. well rest, really what like, it is, is it's a little bit of trauma. Because when you're shocked out of sleep, your body literally is in a fight or flight response for, for a short period of time. So you're developing this, this association, which is why I, this has happened to me. I've been at a retail store. And I'll, and I'll hear an alarm go off. That is the same sound that I woke up to when I was a kid. <laughs> and for like three seconds, I get the same annoying You're like feeling. shell shock. You're like, ah. Yes, yeah. dude. Yeah. No, yes. I 100% I feel the same way. Yeah. That's so that's why that, that, that alarm clock was such a game changer. That just, oh, yeah. you know. I love it, man. It's, yeah. I don't, I don't know where I read it, but I remember, I cause it's been a long time since I've, I've been somebody who snoozes, but I do remember reading somewhere where it's like, no matter how tired you are, like when you hear that, like you just jumping out of bed makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. Than sitting there and yeah, just get up, dude. Yeah. I've just learned to do that. Like that's the more I, I wait, up. the worse I feel. That's how I so wake up. Just get up. I wake yeah. up like I like a I just 
Just well, you know, you know what helped me yeah, with try. that was when I stopped putting my phone next to my bed. Oh, and, you got to put it far away. Yes, yeah, so I put it all the way in this this house. I put it all the way in the bathroom, and so like it goes off, I and I got to yeah, yeah. I, I got to jump up and get all the way in. The you know, they time make, you you know they make um, alarm clocks for people who like snooze all the time. They make some that it, it turns off, it goes off, and the only way to turn it off is you have to do a math equation. <laughs> <laughs> so like it'll go off, and you have to like do that's messed up. Yeah, just to yeah. wake you ass, you know, wake your ass uh, up. You have to like. Oh, that's out. funny. Yeah, I had so I had a an alarm clock that was Garfield. I still to this day. Oh, remember. everybody did. Yeah, it was a, lot, it was a, a Garfield. Like it was his head. Yeah. And his ears. nose, his nose was the snooze and it, and you'd hit his nose, his nose and it would say, nah, don't get up, stay in bed, sleep longer. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you feel like I hate Mondays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you, yeah. Hey, did everybody have that alarm clock? This is our generation. The one that was like black face and it looked like wood. Yes. Uh, on the top, yeah, like with yeah, the, with the, yeah, the gills or yeah, whatever yeah, line. Yeah, yeah, Everybody yeah. had that. One. Oh yeah, the big ass snooze button that was on the very. Yeah. yeah. What is that? I don't know. Did you guys all have that TV? Common one. It's probably because it was the cheapest one. Yeah, that you it's probably the <laughs> same one everybody got at Target or whatever the hell it was. It wasn't Target back then. It was yeah, like Kmart. It was Kmart. Did you was guys, Target not around when we were kids? I don't think. so. I don't think so. No, yeah, I think it. When did Tar I know Kmart was I definitely, definitely know, not definitely when I was not a kid. you. I don't know that. Yeah, definitely Kmart. Kmart. It was yeah, Kmart. Kmart. It had to have been Kmart. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys remember? Did you guys all have the TV? We had the tube in the middle, but it looked it was like wooden. Yeah. And it had every, everybody had the same TV. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. I know. When did Target come on on the scene? I'm it curious. Up. And it and was it it responsible for uh, Kmart dying? I forget why. I read up on why Kmart died one time. I, I Walmart, remember. Target, all those took yeah. it out. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, uh, if you shopped at Kmart, you would get bullied. It'd make yeah. fun of you. Uh -huh. You know, it's, what's funny and about that, I'm actually wearing a <laughs> pair of, uh, the, these are Champion sweats right now. And Champion was a Kmart brand when we were kids. Uh, yeah. oh. That's like having a Huffy bike. So anybody, can you guess when Target was first founded? 19... 91. Ooh, that was a good guess. I, I can because I see it right here. So I'm like, yeah. <laughs> what is it? 1902. What? Yeah, June 24th, 1902, we were, Minneapolis, we Minnesota. <laughs> so I always love companies like this that are like, they, we know them. It must as have like been a regional or something. No, it was probably something else. Was it even a re, was it even a retail store or was it something completely different? Yeah, it was different? something else. Yeah, that's what I mean. <clears throat> what was it? Well, let me get like the- bait Didn't I bring up on the show <laughs> recently about a, a brand that was like been around forever? That yeah, you some would, of them are like hunting it, bait you know shops. Was it a Nazi? Turn into was it like, a Nazi like company? Carhartt Car has Car been around like yeah. over a hundred years. Watch it you know. be a Nazi company. All these old companies, you ever notice that? Like, oh, Bayer, or, you know, BMW or yeah. whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, Nazi company. It used to be a discount retail like store. Hugo Boss. Oh, discount retail store. Okay. Dude, well, Hugo Boss made all the uniforms, the uniforms. for uniforms. Well, yeah, see, Nazis. they have a good book on that. I always like, so I like, I like reading stories on companies like that, that we know them as the big, you know, behemoth, you know, retail store or whatever yeah. that, but then they were for 50 years, they were something else, you know? You know what I find? I had no idea. So That's 1962 crazy. is really when they, I think the stores started to expand and, and go mm -hmm. out. I, you know what, I, you know, what's uh, uh, interesting to me about this kind of stuff is you look at these companies, these old companies that had one, they, they started in one way, then they get adopted by the the, the, the specific counterculture that hates that particular origin. For example, Volkswagen. Mm. Volkswagen mm. was a Nazi company. Mm. Yeah. Gets adopted by the hippies. Volkswagen, it's the <laughs> yeah. peace love car. Like, this is Hitler's car. You're like, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. Hitler was behind some of yeah. the design of it, yeah. I believe. But probably many of them didn't know that, right? I mean, that's, that's what's funny about uh -huh. it. Yeah, that's the, the, the irony. The, the irony yeah. or, the, or Mitsubishi, you know, the Mitsubishi uh, symbol. The triangle. Yeah. The, you know, diamonds. The that was diamonds. because they made their the World War II planes that would fight in, the, it was the Mitsubishi planes or whatever. They made those, uh, those fighter planes. Mm. What were they called? Zeros? Oh yeah, zeros, Japanese zero. Japanese zeros, yeah. yeah. And that was Mitsubishi. So that triangle thing is a propeller. To uh, go back to their their origins. Interesting. Uh, I thought that's what BMW was a propeller. I think so. BMW also. Yeah, mm -hmm. BMW was originally a propeller, and they they, they were planes also, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. BMW makes. Wonder what the mind pump will be in eighty years. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think we're going to be? Sneaker company. <laughs> guitar, <laughs> guitar, <laughs> guitar company. Guitar Maybe. company. I Skateboards. Like yeah, I like it. Nothing left about me. <laughs> That's you sardine guys? you think it will be a sardine, sardine. company sardine. <laughs> can the world's the world's best sardine yeah. <laughs> you know? mind puff mind puff you're stupid speaking yeah. of stupid i'm having a good time uh so this is since we've been together uh on the show not Wait, together physically together, or just not like together, the show. together uh <laughs> since we've had mind pump um it's been a while since adam has been on the like hardcore fitness train <laughs> 
and uh, I can I can sense you're on it uh, finally, like you were back in the like when we first started. Yeah, so well, I wouldn't give me that, that much credit yet, but I'm, I'm no, uh, no, no. You're on it. I could tell the light switch went off every time you say the light switch is on, and it wasn't. I well, could I know tell. Sal gets I could excited because he he decides to show extra selfies in the group thread. <laughs> hey, Adam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah dude. dude. I do appreciate he sends it in the group thread yeah, now, not I'm just like, privately. You know what I'm saying? Uh, no, you no, guys can have privately that. Privately, weird, bro. <laughs> you can have that like <laughs> exchange amongst yourselves. You no, know no, no. I mean? like, I'm doing totally it because fine. it's fun. It's fun. First off, it's a good time. Yeah, no, you guys are like competitive a bit with it I guess. well i like to talk shit. i don't want to do the whole shit talking if 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 you know he's not like fully in because then it's just stupid <laughs> yeah. but because yeah. he's fully in it becomes fun sure so now i'm doing the shit talking fully aware i'm gonna just say this on the podcast fully aware i know i'm talking shit to a, an actual professional at, at ifpb <laughs> pro so i know that at some point it's gonna be you know comical but right now Right now I'm talking. I don't know, dude. You're pretty gassed up right now. You've been you've been on one for a minute, dude. So it's this has got to be. I mean, you you've never. I don't think you were have ever fallen off. No. When would you say you were in the worst shape of this podcast? Oh, I mean, when my gut health would get really off. You know, there there were. Can you recall? Can you recall like when like you know we went through a phase, or can you attach it to something? Yeah, probably a few years ago, like what program we wrote or something that we were doing. I don't know. It was probably about four years ago. I was going through it with with my gut health, and I was just my lean body mass was hard to keep it going, and it was I just felt like dog crap the whole time. But I have never stopped working out. I've never really stopped being consistent with that because I have uh, an addiction. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I know you're talking about you and I right now, but actually Katrina just this two nights ago was actually talking about Justin's body. So oh, again, yeah. Well, yeah. So <laughs> Why is that I don't, I don't know if that's weird for you house. or not, but it's kind of weird for me. My wife talking <laughs> no. about your body. What were you guys doing like, though? Laying in time. bed. You know what I'm saying? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a weird time to bring up Justin's body right yeah, now. Do you guys have sex afterwards? <laughs> it's awkward. Yeah, it was, yeah, real awkward sex. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, real awkward sex. Yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah, you know, Justin's body's yeah, looking she, real good. Yeah. Yeah. She just kept talking about having cheese references too. It was so weird. I was like, oh, what are you yeah. talking about right now? No, she was talking about that this is the most consistent she'd seen Justin look really Really, really good. So, yeah. I we're this is I don't. This, I don't, is, a, this is a circle jerk. What's we'll going on here? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where this is going, but yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I like it. Yeah, so, I, like I don't know where this so, is going, but I like it. <laughs> I'll pretend like I don't care. Yeah, like yeah. No, I do. I've I've been trying. You know, I've been, I, I've been trying to stay consistent. I think you're the most consistently praised upon by our both of our wives. Did you know that? It, no, I, I brought it up too. So is he? What the hell's going on? You make I, Courtney all insecure. I don't know. <laughs> Does Courtney say anything about us? That's yeah. fine. Maybe yeah. she'll listen. She's you like, know, does she ever say anything about Courtney? Me or, or shit about us. All the time. Yeah. Good or bad? Yeah. No, she says good things about you guys. All Liar. The time. Liar. <laughs> she does. Okay, so I want to hear. I just a, don't tell you on, on a on a serious <laughs> on a serious note because uh, I know that I know you'll we'll get the DMs and the audience will want to know anyways is uh, what are the things that you're currently doing like different or the same right now as far as training diet like what what does that look like for you right now for Justin? me yeah 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 um honestly like I've just been really more anabolic f- like type pro- programming in terms of like I'll do like a real um, you know, foundational session. And then I'll undulate it with like rubber bands. I've been using a lot of rubber bands in between my workout days. For, oh, interesting. And really just doing that, like specifically trigger sessions, but like multiples, like each and every other day. And so I've just been like stacking them like back to back. I started out doing like 15 minutes and then it's just slowly been increasing my time length. Cause mm. The kids have been like off a bit of uh, gymnastics, like it's starting to kind of slow down a little. And so I'm like, I can extend my workouts a little bit more instead of running to pick them up. Yeah. And so it's been the better, like the over the last like month or so, I've been like increasing my volume and time length. Uh, but yeah, I've been like pretty consistently stacking those workouts. You're doing something with diet too though, right? Yeah. So I've been trying to like really peer into my gut issues and like, mm. and this is just something that's just been... Uh, plaguing me over the last, like, especially it's been increasing this year. Mm. Uh, I've been really struggling with like, um, just having that like crazy acid reflux. And even to the point where I'll have like stress, it'll have something that like, I'm kind of sweating and then it'll, it'll, 
aggravate it and it'll like get oh, my, my gut to like, interesting. you get inflamed. And, and so like, oh, it's just kind of funny. Cause like I will bring Dr. Cabral on and like, he's like kind of going through the inflammation stuff. And I'm like, oh shit. You know, like I know because <laughs> it, it feel like I feel inflamed like all the time. And I, and I've been adjusting and trying to like, you know, make sure it's it's not inflammatory type foods and things i'm in my diet but it's still there and so i know it's like more i have to did you uh, do the gun test did you do the whole poop thing and everything yeah and so i, I bought like all three he has this like um this package for like a, a a full gut kind of um three different tests you can do one for like the the overgrowth and one for like you know um uh, intolerances and then oh. um, oh, for the parasites, thing? like the whole the game. I'm like, I'm like trying to, to, to really hammer this out so I can move forward and just, okay, now I can actually start building again. It feels like for me, it feels like I'm always trying to like cut down. I haven't been in a building phase in a long time because mm -hmm. my guts, been when so your guts off. off, you can't Yeah, that limited my, it always limits my food intake when it's off. Uh, and when it's good, I can absorb the food I'm freaking eating. Otherwise, it just messes me up. I have to fast and shit all the time. Is there yeah. anything that you think, um, like, that you've identified that you, you you probably think it is, and then you're looking for more confirmation? Or do you think a lot of this is just, Jeez. like, as we're getting older, <laughs> do you think that, you know, uh, like a bunch of sorority girls, we're catching Sal's, you know, <laughs> princess gut? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I, yeah, I had speculation. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm like close proximity. Yeah. You know, we used to, I used to make fun of him. Maybe yeah. this is like karma. bacteria is jumping you over know? To us. Yeah, it's like coming back you over guys here. Bacteria. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I, I think, um, yeah, that's that's all the stuff I'm kind of going through. I'm like, where, where did this all stem from? But I think just eliminating things like even alcohol, I'm sure aggravated it. Like, and that's something that like you know, infrequently kind of comes in and out over the weekends for me. So I've been trying to lower the intake with that. Uh, and I mean, I'll look into cheese, but like, really, like, <laughs> really, I'm so going to look at everything else. Like hey, coffee, say that? like, <laughs> I'm gonna look at. Um, I'll gl take a look gluten's at it. a big offender, yeah. you know. So I've I've definitely nailed that He's all one. Gluten, down. alcohol, <laughs> look at you. anything processed. <laughs> Honestly, anything processed, anything, especially if I have like some something with a lot of sugar in it, like, and I've. So that screams. It uh, kills me. The sugar that that all screams SIBO to me. Yeah. SIBO and potential parasite, but SIBO because. Uh, when I when I would deal with SIBO, and I have to treat myself for SIBO like symptoms probably once a year. But when I have like full on SIBO, it's like sugar and fermentable carbohydrates flare. Destroy. Yes. Yeah, those like, are the worst. Like the worst. So that's what, it, but I mean, you won't know until you get your test back. And, yeah. And, and then the motivation behind the the bands and stuff, was that to kind of like intentionally reduce uh, intensity for you? Was it like, is that what it, the idea was like, this yeah, is going to yeah. force me, I can't go crazy heavy and really yeah. push. Yeah. Because what, uh, another thing that I was kind of um, parsing out was my hips, like, because I would be in traffic and locked traffic and I would do heavy squats, heavy deadlifts. And like, I, I just felt like it just kept like getting tighter and tighter and aggravating me. Like just sitting here, I was just like always uh, like trying to stretch and do things. And it was just pissing me off. So I went full like unilateral for a while and that helped. But uh, honestly, yeah, the bands are just like, I feel like they're just adding more recovery and like more, um, I'm getting more volume of movement. And, and so like a better circulation, like mm. all that kind of stuff. And it's, so I can now do more barbell lifts, but then also complement it. So it's like, I, I'm not as like tight and restricted. Oh, it's yeah. working. Yeah. Dude. And so you're the, probably the biggest and leanest I've ever seen you. Um, I know you talk about times when before where you've been bigger and stuff like that, but I'd say you're single digit body fat and the biggest I've seen you consistently right now. Is it, do you attribute, I mean, you normally all attribute to gut stuff. Is that? Well, that had the biggest impact, but then I went on the testosterone. So that made it, that probably gave, gave me a good 12 pounds of lean body mass. The gut health probably gave me another six or seven at least. And then some of the peptides that, um, I've been experimenting with are really interesting. The, the, the biggest impact was ibutamorin, which uh, that's a growth hormone secretagogue. That just makes my appetite go up a lot. So it makes it easy for me to eat. 
Um, and then the Mott C, that shredded the hell out of me. I know Doug's been using Mott C now. Oh, I've been waiting and, on mine. And you notice the energy from it. The energy, I haven't noticed any fat loss from okay. it, though. But the energy, for sure. Yeah, it's good, definitely. I've had some poor sleep lately, and uh, I've been surprisingly good. Yeah, but I would say it's 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 just the combination of all that stuff that's made the biggest impact. Where are you at right now with everything? I mean, I'm very consistent on my workouts. Yeah, I'm doing uh, MAPS Anabolic again, probably for, I don't know, the, the 20th time. Yeah. <laughs> At least the 20th time, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm on phase three, which is a nice, brutal, you know, brutal phase. And um, yeah, I just, I'm staying consistent. Uh, my weight's probably down just a little bit right now, but I could take off some more fat. Yeah, you look pretty good. Now, Adam, just for you, basic, you've just been consistent longer. Mm -hmm. And your diet is, because I see you, there was a while there where you were never bringing your food in. You would order food. Oh yeah, I haven't. I haven't started. Now I you're bringing food every day. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't meal prepped like we are right now in God years, years. You know, um, and even if you ever did see me bring a meal once or twice, it was just because it was like leftovers or something like that. Yeah. Like we're actually prepping to where I have. I oh, like right now there's six or seven meals in there right now. We have the meals that we just got from Don Saladino. So yeah, I haven't. And then eating out has literally only been, you know, Nick the Greek, shish kebab, you know, chicken yeah. kebabs, uh, poke bowls, or... Just better choices. Yeah, like, so I'm not eating anything really uh, outside of... And I'm actually, for the first time, what's what I am doing different that it, for me is... I, I By this time, I'd be pretty dialed in as far as tracking. And I'm not tracking. I'm not tracking anything really right now. I'm not tracking steps right now. Like I don't. Yeah, really I know you're at fucking pre phase. You're not even at phase one right now. Yeah, yeah. So I'm. So I'm not even. Which is exciting for me because I actually feel really good. And I and I and I haven't tested to see exactly where I'm body fat. I can see. I mean, I'm taking my pictures. Like I'll every, guess. I wish you did it in the beginning. Damn it, because uh, <clears throat> I mean, I have a picture at the beginning, but I don't have. I don't. Have I'm going to guess that you went. You you went about six pounds up and down, lean body mass and and fat mass at least six to eight is what it looks like. Looks like you gained six to eight pounds of lean body mass. Went down about six to eight. Yeah, it might even be fat. more. Maybe feel, not. Yeah, yeah. If, when I look at the pictures, like, I'm, I'm actually, really? re, yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm impressed with where I've been able to get in such a short period of time with all out without tracking, and obviously no cardio or anything like that. And I'm just intuitively eating and intuitively training. Like I'm not um, following exact one of our plans. Like I've I started off with kind of an anabolic, or I'd say actually MAPS 15 kind of approach. So MAPS 15 was kind of what I was running before I really started dialing in. And then it started to look like a blend of MAPS 15 and anabolic, um, and, and all based off of how I was feeling. You know, like, oh, okay, I can handle a little more volume. Let's do more of a full foundational anabolic. Uh, my body's still sore, if not feeling it, or oh, food wasn't great. Oh, I'm gonna go MAPS 15. So it's kind of bouncing back and forth that. Now I'm probably starting to look more like a MAPS aesthetic or MAPS wow, split. Wow, really? Wow, good. Yeah, cool. maybe not quite as much volume as aesthetic, but where I'm starting to, um, you know, have these kind of focus days. I'm, I'm in the gym right now. I'm trying to go to the gym almost every day. And if I don't, if I don't have a muscle group to hit, then I'm, I'm walking or doing mobility stuff. Like, you know what I wish more people communicated was, uh, cause this is actually profound. We've, we're all, you know, in our forties, we've all been doing this for a long time. Everybody talks about how much harder it is when you get older. I if disagree. You, yeah, dude, if you've been consistent. So if you're listening right now and you're in your twenties and you're going to be like, I'm going to do this consistently. <clears throat> and then you get to your thirties and forties. Uh, it's easier. Like mm -hmm. the muscle memory, that's like a legit, like real thing. Like the amount of work I need to do now to maintain is nothing compared to the work I used to have to do to build. In well, my, you know your body so much <laughs> better too. And like what moves the needle for you the most with nutrition. It's so. like easy compared to what you're you right. There's, a, there's, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, it's all that. Right? Yeah. Multi prong, right. Or whatever. It's, if I were to look back at like <clears throat> just where I'm at right now, and I'd say I'm really only about a, a, a month or maybe five weeks of like really, like really, really dialed in food and, and, and training consistently. I'm in better shape right now than I was at 25 training my ass off for a year consistent on copious amounts of steroids. Isn't that funny? Yeah. That's how much of a difference. That's all, so crazy. Mm -hmm. that, and then you're right. I wish that people, no one told me that. Everyone said it gets harder when you get older. What gets harder is if you didn't train yeah. those decades, yeah. you know. You just and, completely fall and, off. Yeah, yeah, and you fall off completely, and now you're 45 years old, yeah. and you're getting back in the swing of things. But if you've done a pretty good job of, you know, training and eating relatively consistent for years and years and years, it actually gets 
a lot easier to all the points you guys are pointing out. I mean, I know like Katrina always, you know, teases me or gets frustrated when she sees me like kind of turn the knobs. And I'm like, well, think about this. I've, I've done this for so long and I've done it at the competitive level. So I, mm-hmm. even without weighing and zooming that I can, I know, I know what I, I feel like when I'm a little over. I know what I feel like when I'm a little under, I know what I feel like when I'm overreaching, when I'm not doing enough. Like I just, I have the feel no, the, down. The studies are clear. Like if you work out for a while, you increase the amount of like stem cells that turn into new muscle cells. <clears throat> And so you actually develop a, a greater capacity and for this is just for lack of a better term for permanent muscle, yep. for permanent muscle gain. So if you've been, you know, been built for 30 years to keep that amount of muscle um, is way easier than it would be had you never done it in the first place. And I've known men in their 70s who <clears throat> you look at them, you're like, oh, my gosh, like you're really muscular. And I see you work out. You're only here a few days a week. And then you talk to them like, oh, yeah, I was a. You know, I was a professional athlete or I, I trained for years and years and years. And it's just, it, and nobody sells this point because yes, of course you age, of course, certain things change. Like I can't just jump into a heavy workout like I used to. Now I have to be careful. That's the stuff, kind of stuff. I know, that's yeah. it. That's yeah. the stuff I noticed the biggest difference. Yeah. Like it, it, at 25, I could like right now yeah. go to the court and play basketball. Yeah, yeah. Where like, <laughs> now like, you like, do like a, like a 45. Oh, I'm scared to death to do that. Like I'm scared that <laughs> I would. all my priming, dude. Like, yeah, crazy. yeah. Or I mean, I did. So yesterday I, I trained legs uh, again, which in, within like two days. Uh, and you know, I was still a little sore from last workout. Like I, 25, I hop right underneath the bar. I spent 20 minutes priming and warming up and stuff like that before I get, can get under the bar. Like that's probably the biggest difference I know, like disadvantage of being older. But you know, the other thing that I I think speaks to age is because, okay, we talk a lot about trying to get people to change the mindset into lifting more like it's, it's a skill. And just like any other skill, if you were playing a sport like golf or something like that, and if you've put decades of, you know, somewhat consistency at playing the game, man, when you're 40, 50 years old, you got this beautiful, beautiful swing yep. because you, yep. you've done it. And you and even if you haven't done it for a little while, you can get right back into it really quick because you've all that memory of doing that. I feel that that has to contribute too. like I can get under the bar and make every rep. I mean, Arnold used to talk about this, right? He could do one set and it'd be more effective than somebody who does an hour in the yes, gym or whatever, yes. right? I, I feel like maybe not exactly that exact, you know, uh, level, but I definitely feel like I can get in. Oh, 20 minutes. I can make it. Yeah. And I effective. can make my little 20 minute workout more effective than 80% of the people in the gym crushing it for an hour and a yeah, half. No, mm-hmm. agreed. 100%. Everything from, because I can connect right where I want to connect and yeah. get right to work. I know what exercises are going to give me my biggest bang for my buck. Yeah. I know how to learn. Le- I listen to my body on how sore it is or isn't or how I ate and so how much I can push it or can't push it. Like You also develop things. gym yeah. wisdom and gym confidence, meaning um, I was, you know, in my 20s, I was way more concerned with how much weight I'm lifting, what I look like when I'm working out. Am I lifting more than the person next to me? I pretty much don't care anymore. Now, that doesn't mean it can't get triggered every once in a while. Every once in a while, there's some young dude and he'll work out next to me and I'll, I'll you know, I'll feel that inner ego come out or whatever. But more and more, I care less and less. It's like, you guys, you, you ever see like a bunch of 20-year-olds at a bar, 20-year-old dudes, and you could just see the insecurity and the, <laughs> yeah, bro. Trying uh, so yeah, hard. Yeah. Trying so hard to talk to girls, whatever. And then you see a bunch of, you know, yeah. older dudes hanging out, even if they're single and they're just chill and confident. And it's like, we don't need to try so hard. It's like that in the gym. Like you go to the gym and I don't care how much weight I have on. I really don't. In fact, I told you guys, the only time I really lift heavy is when I'm by myself in here. I purposely don't do it at the gym anymore when there's people around me because yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I get better workouts that way. Yeah, and, it, right. and, and, and again, I don't care nearly as much. I mean, I used to intentionally do like really lightweight type stuff around like super jack dudes in the gym just to start up conversation, especially when I was a trainer. Cause I, it would be like, guys would be like, dude, I don't understand. Like, how are you doing like a simple exercise? Like, <laughs> yeah. that? well, you know, that, so I thought that was always a great strategy to do that. And a smart thing for not getting injured. Cause yeah. Lifting with each other is that's the that's why we don't do it a lot of times. Because, well, we still are. Well, we'll still yeah. it'll it'll trigger in us for sure because we're all around the same age. Yeah. <laughs> so now it's more like, oh, really? Yeah. Let's have a good time. It's and the shit talking will be fun, dude. I've been reading about. Um, so, did you guys know that there's laws that are put in place to protect child actors in traditional media? So they have laws and regulations for child actors, how they get paid, who takes care of what. Um, you know, who, you know, manage that manages them. As long as they're, as you mean, is there finances or like what finances there's, there's, there's just lot, there's just lots of regulations or there's at least regulations put in place to 
quote unquote protect child uh, actors or child, you know, ch- people under the age of 18 in media. Those protections are non-existent in social media, in social media. Interesting. So right now what they're talking about are as this like, cause there was this, this, this girl that was anonymous and she was talking about how much she hates her parent influencers. So there's like this, this, this class of social media videos and, and, and media producers where it's like families, Oh, we're the so-and-sos and look what our kids do and look, our kids do this and we do that. And there's no protections, no regulations, none of that. And there was this girl that came forward. She's like 16. And she's like, I hate this. She's like, I feel like I have to perform in order to support my family. I don't get the money. It's like, it's like super, it's like lots of pressure. I can't do things that normal kids do or whatever. Mm. Normally there'd be certain protections, but those don't exist in this whole like parent influencer space wow. type of deal. I mean, I can't, I, I can only that. imagine. Could you guys imagine being like a 12 or oh 13 God. year old? And your boy? mom and dad are like yeah, putting I, up the phones and the cameras and all right, kids have breakfast and here's what's going I've on. I've seen and, this with a couple of these kids that um, they'll try out new toys like Nerf guns yeah. and things like that. And then, you know, the, the dad is obviously orchestrating the whole thing and he shows up in the videos, but it's like, I mean, since day one, they were like five or so. I know. And my kids were young watching this and, I, I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, I wonder if these kids even like doing this anymore because they're like older now and they're still. Now, as a, as a mental exercise, have you tried to compare it to, you know, other mediums, say 20, 30 years ago when it was new and then like the the alarmist about, hmm. oh, this has got to be so scary for kids. And then it ended up being fine. Like, I think it's all we tried to. If we go, if we, okay, go past the regulation part, the protections, because I think most of those exist uh, to protect their money and their interests. Besides that, I'm going to make a statement that might sound a little um, bold or whatever, but I think if you're a parent and you are building a media business with your children, uh, I think that you're not doing a good job as a parent. That's just my personal uh, opinion. Because well, it, it depends. It depends. Like at, at what? I, it, I mean, give me an example well, of how you're exa- not. Well, okay. Well, we just had Brett and Chilene in here just recently and they have a, I think their boy is. He's an adult. Yeah, he's an adult now. Right. Yeah, so that's I'm what talk- I'm saying. So no. I'm saying, like, at what at what age? I'm like- talking about b- below adulthood. Yeah. I mean, Once I, you're an adult, you're an adult. I, I feel like your boy would be somebody who uh, I would feel comfortable. He's he's wise enough. He has he has some skills that I think could. My 17 like, year old. Yeah. Oh, he's a year away from being an adult. I, you know, I, I'm I'm talking about kids. Why? Well, okay. So where? What? What point then? Because I, I could. I think he could have done it last year at 16. I would. So, I, mean, I wouldn't like, have done it. I won't do it unless my kids are adults. Mainly because then I can't necessarily control them. Right. And they're 18. They can go do it themselves. But um, you take away their childhood. One of the mm. worst possible things that can happen to a kid mm. is they become famous and fake loved for being a child. Yeah, yeah. You ever seen a kid like you know those child stars that are like six or seven? Oh my god, they're so cute. They're all they go through up. puberty. It, yeah. And you know everybody's not. That have we ever had a child through. star not get fucked up? That's what I'm saying. Do we have an example of one that? Ha- I'm mean, serious. Seriously, I, do we? Do we have a Macaulay child? Macaulay Culkin disappeared because yeah. of, of half that stuff. I know. I know. And they, he's not exactly. They all. Not they up. all have gone down like the crazy amount yeah. of drugs and abuse and all the weird stuff. So. Is, can, do, do, is anyone, I'm thinking. I can't think of yeah, anybody. Yeah, do you know a, a childhood? No. I think Mary Kate and Ashley also. I think they actually like it pulled themselves completely away from media and, and were able to kind of dissociate themselves with it. But they they went through a lot of hell to get there. I yeah, I, look, look. Even okay, pretend like no abuse happens. None of the weird shit that happens in Hollywood that people talk about. None of that stuff happens. All that happens is a six year old kid becomes mega famous or has millions of followers for being a cute six-year-old. Now, think about that. This is a six-year-old that is getting loved and attention, fake or whatever, by all these people. Their value is now, they're peaking essentially now. They don't have the maturity to deal with that. I don't think a 20-year-old necessarily has a maturity to deal with that, but a six-year-old? And then they grow up, and then at some point, they're not popular anymore. Um, Maybe because now they don't look like a kid anymore or whatever, it's hard to reinvent yourself so many times. Like, how do you deal with that, right? That would be hard for an adult to deal yeah, with. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it is kind of like, I mean, I also see it with sports where, like, you know, p- parents will get too vested and, mm. and, and really push and throttle their kid to be out in the forefront. And they're living vicariously through them yeah. and all of their successes and, and 
Um, I, I that's where it gets tricky for me is like you know when you're pouring all of um, your own intention like to to get into the kid to to be successful. Yeah. yeah, you know I don't know where where exactly I stand on this. I mean I I think uh, if you've listened to this show long enough, I believe I was the first one to be the biggest alarmist about this stuff early on. You guys used to tease me about the the book that I would consistently tout on this right, right. on this channel and stuff. But and, and I've tried to be more open minded to the positive things that right. I already I already pointed out for a long time now all the negative things that I saw potentially from it. But then I think like, well, man, when I was 16, you know, I was, I was working a dairy, right, milking cows and shoveling shit at, you know, four o'clock in the morning. If I had this opportunity, say, for example, to make basketball videos, tutorials that teach people how to do a crossover and a jump shot, and I got a following from it, and I actually could monetize it, and maybe even went somewhere where I could really monetize it, where it was it was big enough to where I was making good money off of it, man, would I? And, and if I was the father of me, would I want to deprive me of that potential of you doing the, that? Right. The, so, like, I, I see where you're going. You know what the challenge of that is? <clears throat> is when you think back to when you were a kid, it's hard to not carry the wisdom you have now, or at least some of it and go back in time. Yeah. Like think of 16 year old Adam getting a lot of money and a lot of attention. Yeah. But I think, I think it comes back to the same thing always, right? Which is it's my responsibility. It's our responsibility as parents to help them navigate through that. Mm. So do I, I think it would have been a miserable thing for me. And this is not to throw shade on my mom and dad or anything like that, but I don't think that they would have the awareness to even be parenting me through that. I believe I have that awareness. So let's say my son, okay, in 10 years or whatever, he, he in 10 years from now, he's in high school or he'll be getting ready for high school or whatever. And it, use my example, he's really good at a sport or he's very artistic and people follow him for his skill or his art. And he's got this starting to build this mass, this following on social media. I think that I would be communicating to him all the pros and cons of what he's going through. And like, and I think that you could, there's a healthy way potentially to allow him to utilize this amazing tool that has now evolved. He would have to be, man, uh, that would be so rare. To it have wouldn't the be him. It would kid. be me. I would have but to he's be. He's going to be, he's also going to be in it and he's going to have to have a, a level. Does he have the maturity? Would he potentially he have He won't the have the maturity. It will rely on me to be a good father and be a part of that process that I, he, and he trusts me to give him wisdom and to share that so that he can learn from maybe the pitfall mm -hmm. that I have yeah. or the other people have. So I think that's where it becomes, if you just let your kids do their thing on social media and build these huge followings and get famous and you're not involved in it whatsoever, I don't know, I mean, 100 I think that's incredibly dangerous and not a smart move. Have you heard the cases though where there's like that? There's like a 15 year old, they're doing this and the parents are like trying to meet, manage it, trying, and then the kid's like, I'm taking you to court so I could se separate myself and have full control of my, of my whatever. And it happens and they win that. It's, it's just basically what you're doing is you're like, here we go, let's tiptoe into hell, but don't worry, listen to me. It's hard to get your kid to listen to you anyway. Hmm. So my point is, is that that's a, that would be a rare exception. And, and, and you are a rare exception of, of a father. So maybe that would, maybe that would work. I mean, for me personally, I would, <clears> I could <throat> see doing it and being like, you really want to do this and they're really passionate about it, and they really genuinely want to, then I'd say, fine, you're not going to be the one on camera. You can produce it. You can create it. You can be the person in charge, but to have you be the one that's the face and the person in front of it, that's where I think a lot of the risk is. But I, mean, be, I don't know. I've never dealt with this. Yeah, I, I think Justin will be the first one to probably deal with this the most. I, yeah. I, your kids seem to not have as much of a desire for it, Sal. Your boys. Yeah, my youngest really has a bit of a, um, he does want like to be in front of the camera. He wants to be involved somehow with like some kind of content producing and so yeah i i'm listening to you guys kind of hash this out because it is it's one of those things like i'm concerned about a lot of things with social media and in what directions to go i'm really just trying to foster uh an environment for him to be curious about uh what that all entails and then we have you know conversations about it um and just i'm not going to be the one engineering and manufacturing it for him so that's the biggest mm. thing is like if he really wants to kind of pursue something like that, I got to see like him stumble and create and, um, you know, start to uh, build it himself specifically. And then, you know, I will, I will definitely be there as like sort of a, a guide, but um, I don't anticipate him 
really launching anything till probably later in the teens and like, um, you know, down the road, he's just young right now. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, dude. I, I don't really, cause if he's really good, that's going to be a conundrum I'm in. Right. Right. Well, there's so much that you can well, learn so, behind the scenes too. And well, so much of the business you can learn. Right? I'm, I'm going yeah, to give you another e example and I know it's totally different because it's not tech involved, but think of this. Okay. Um, it's incredibly dangerous. Like you could easily die uh, blasting down a double diamond hill with moguls and flying down there on a pair of skis or a snowboard. Yet there's seven year olds that that do it. And there's parents that allowed them to do it at one point. Yeah, no, that's so, But that's different. That's more of an acute. Of course it's different. No, that's more of an acute danger. This is a psychological developmental uh, danger. Um, by the way, you wouldn't let your kid go down a double diamond if they weren't physically skilled to do so. How do you determine if they have the maturity to and, deal with fame? And that's exactly why it falls back on the father, right? It falls back on me as a dad to have those conversations. If I'm going to give him a, a tool this dangerous, okay, if I'm going to allow him to utilize this this sword, this knife, these skis, these, these things that could potentially harm him, whether it's acute yeah. or chronic, it doesn't matter. If I'm going to give him the keys to this thing, I better damn well be responsible as a dad and have a, more than one conversation. It's not, hey, son, I'm giving you this this access to this 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 plethora of information and content creation, and see you later, have fun, and I yeah. and then check back with me in a year or two. Well, I think no different is, than I would say, here's a pair of skis, go down the mountain, let me know how it goes for you. Well, like, I think the key I, I'm going to baby step them. Yeah, that. I think the key is you're saying you're going to be very thoughtful and a part of the process. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I understand that, and I know you. You're 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 not. You know, you're a one in a million dad, right? So, uh, you know, I get where you're, you're going with that. And I'm, I guess more generally, I think it's probably a bad idea. Um, and I don't know too many parents who are not like thoughtful that way. I think a lot of parents get caught up in it th themselves. They see the money, they see the attention, they like it too. Mm -hmm. Look at my kid, that's an extension of me. This is awesome. Let's keep pushing this. Let's keep, you know, doing this thing. Yeah. I think so that's that more you just hit on what I think is the is the is the real danger and the real example of what we're seeing with some of these really bad outcomes is, you know, how many parents are guilty of this? I mean, I'd be guilty of this to want to vicariously live through my son, right? Imagine my son, you know, mm -hmm. becomes really good at basketball, better than I ever was. Like, oh my God, there's a part of me that I will constantly have to be having conversations with myself, not him, yeah. going like calm the fuck down. It's not you. This yeah. is not your life. It's like, if he wants to play, he plays. If he doesn't like, so it's no different. Right. And you got to think that there are a lot of people. I think we're a bit of an anomaly that never wanted fame, never wanted attention. This is also why I think this works so well, but a lot of people like that and want that and seek that and maybe never had it their whole life. And then all of a sudden their seven year old or 12 year old you make, is getting it. You make a good point. Mm -hmm. You make a very good point. What are, what are the conditions that create a person that seeks and desires that kind of broad attention from lots of strangers? So that means that's right. a good point, because I think if you're that kind of person that seeks that and wants it and desires it and continues to desire it, there's something there that was missing. There's a hole there that was missing because it's strangers. I mean, it's really what it is. It's a bunch of people that know you that act like they love you. It's not real. It really isn't. I mean, mm -hmm. I wouldn't trade that for one friend that actually, that actually know and care for me. I wouldn't right. trade a million yep. followers for that. Right. And see, and you, and you guys are good fathers that this is a type of conversation that you communicate. Did you guys see the, the post I shared of um, Denzel Washington the other day, the little mm -hmm. video clip of that. And they were talking about this. The guy was interviewing and was, you know, talking about the system, you know, and is it, is it failing our kids? Uh -oh. and, is that, and he's like, no, 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 no. He's like, it starts as, as in the house as a, as a parent. Now he's oh, talking right. about a kid who, who was 14 years old, who shot a 12 year old kid or what like that. And everybody wants to blame the guns, wants to blame the system, wants to blame this. And so he's just funny. like, he's like, no, it's, it starts with, fun. I feel the same way with what with the conversation we're having right now. It's like, yes, this media thing could be a very dangerous tool. It could be also a very powerful tool. It can also be a very positive thing. And it's our responsibility as parents to be having these types of conversations with our, our adolescent and young teenage kids as they grow up and communicating the pitfalls and the dangers of that. And what does it say about us if we seek that type of attention? That All the points that you're making, I think the important part is to talk about it and is to have that conversation. And granted, rem remember, this, uh, this is coming from the guy who was like alarmist about yeah. this just, what, three, four and, years ago. And also be able to judge when they, when they, you know, as a parent, well, I think they're mature enough to deal with this situation. Like you wouldn't be like, hey, right. five-year-old kid, let's try alcohol so we know what it feels like. You know, like 
they're not ready. They don't have the maturity and understanding. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, that matters. That's a big part that, of it. Yeah. You know, that's probably one of the hardest things that probably parents today are dealing with is I think, and I know many people have said this, I think they realize that they, they open the can of worms too, uh, too yes, early yes, and yes. now trying to like put it all back in. It's yeah, like, imagine you got your 12 year old, yeah. you're like, let's try this out overnight. A nightmare. They become famous. Now you're like, oh, we got to pull the plug. Yeah. And they've been on TikTok yeah. and playing that exactly. shit since they were five. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, good luck. Yeah, good you luck know. at that point. Yeah. Good luck yeah. trying to tell them no and, and, and regulate that, yeah, you know? Yeah. So, so anyway, we're, we're, we're supposed to talk about Caldera. Do, are we allowed to talk about. Uh, no, 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 no. You can't. Oh, you can't tell. No, no, no. I, but I can, I'll tell you this. I'm I excited. See your ad everywhere, though. Yeah. I know that much. So uh, Katrina told me, out. let me tell you when this, this, uh, this is uh, going live. What, what day are we, are we going live, Doug, right now with this episode? It is Thursday, April 13th. So May 2nd is when the, the new, the new, product, the new product drops, which I'm super excited about, but I can't I, share. I will say this. I get more and more DM. Every time I talk about how my wife stole my serum and now she just uses it all up and loves it more than any other skin product right? that she uses, I'm getting more DMs from guys where they're like, yeah, I got Caldera. Because yeah. you guys talked about it. Now my wife and their significant it. other just yeah. absorbs it. Yeah. Which yeah. one of our it's friends happened. did we just run into that was just oh it was Ben Greenfield. Yeah, he's, yeah he was talking about how good yeah, it is. Ben Ben came in and he saw my my used it. jars of that and he was like, Oh my god, dude, I was uh, they sent me some stuff. I was like, I'm blown away. I'm gonna I'm gonna work with them. An now incredible too. product. Yeah, yeah. Love yeah. absolutely love them. So shout out, uh Doug, I gave you one that I wanted to mention. Did you write it down? Because I totally forgot. Yeah, it's Daily Stoic. Oh, the Daily Stoic. Daily Stoic. Great. Quotes yeah. on stoicism. Um, I could pull one up now. Let me look them up. It's um, I like it because every day, you know, they'll come up in my feed and it's a great reminder. Um, like uh, here, I'll read right now. Live your whole life unswayed by outside forces and with a whole holy joyful heart. That's Marcus Aurelius. So just, these are just great. You know, here's another one. Indifference to external events and a commitment to justice in your own acts. So every day you read one of these and it's like sets you on the right path. Have you guys ever read Marcus Aurelius's meditations before? I, y y That's uh, a great read too. Yeah. yeah. And it's, some, it's structured that way. It's structured almost like a, you know, Proverbs daily devotional. Yeah. yeah. Like that type of way. Yeah, and I, it's a really good read, especially if you're somebody who is, you know, uh, a, a little uh, turned off by anything that's you know religious. Right. Um, I think it's a it's a good it's always, good philosophical. Uh, it is. It's a good alternative guidance. if you're somebody who get, who's very staunch about I would like never, you don't like the metaphysical aspect of religion. Yeah, or right. you would never pick the Bible up to. It doesn't matter how much you sit here and tell the people that there's unbelievable amounts of wisdom in it. Doesn't matter. I'm so turned off by that or whatever. You have some trauma from childhood. You're still trying to deal with whatever. This is, I think, a good alternative totally. to to that. Hey, check this out. Very rarely do we work with a product that helps improve sleep quality. Most of them just make you groggy, interrupt your REM stages of sleep. They may help you kind of get sleepy and go to sleep, but they don't really improve sleep quality. Where there's a, a new product called Sleep Breakthrough from Buy Optimizers that actually improves the quality of your sleep. I've been testing this for a while. My wife's been using it. Give it to my kids even. It's actually quite remarkable. You take it before you go to bed, and you, you wake up way more refreshed. And we've actually tracked the stages of sleep while taking this. And it does increase and improve those deep stages of sleep. Go check them out. Uh, go to sleepbreakthrough.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump 10 and get 10% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Jason Remmer. Is tucking the tailbone at the bottom of a deep squat still bad if you're going slow and controlled and maintaining stability in that range of motion? Oh, There's a bit of controversy around this. The most co it is. There's lots of controversy around it. I, I would say generally, generally for the average person, you probably want to stop your squat depth before this starts to happen because the spine, as it flexes and extends under load, you run the risk of hitting the the end ranges of motion with the spine if you don't have good stability and control. And when you hit that end range of motion, then what starts to support the weight isn't necessarily the muscles around the spine, but rather the spine mm -hmm. itself and the disc. And this is when you can start to run into some issues. Now, the reason why this isn't true for everybody is because some flexion and extension in somebody who's strong and got control, as long as it's not at the end range of motion. If they're active and intense and controlling yeah. it in that position, that's one yeah. thing. But there are the instances where, yeah, you're resting on your spine at that point. Not good. Yeah. yeah I, I'm glad you said that because I think that this isn't, this isn't, there's, there is a, a natural tucking of the spine. When you hit ass to grass all the way down, uh, a little bit happens. Right? Yeah, they're, they're, you're going to see a little bit of a tucking of the tailbone. It's just it's a it's very natural. 
So it's, it's where it becomes excessive, which by the way, you normally will f- feel these in uh, your, your erectors. If you are, if you have a fle- uh, uh, excessive flexion and extension of your spine, your low back will be on fire when you're doing these squats. That's how I always know too, when I need to address this is that if I'm starting to feel my low back, those erectors get pumped like crazy and more than I'm feeling in my quads and my glutes, I know that either one, I need to shorten up the range of motion for now, or I need to address some mobility stuff to get to a place where that's comfortable. Now, if you are told you have some sort of a butt wink or tailbone tuck at the bottom and you don't feel bad at all, I would probably say you're fine. Like if you're not feeling your erectors pumped up, you're not feeling any sort of uh, pain at all, you're probably okay. You got to be tough. I mean, that's tough because um, people can get away with something and then it become bad. You know, it's funny. It's like you could get, I don't know if you guys ever tested this with a client. You get someone in a split stance, put their front leg on something high and they can go real deep without any Tailbone tuck. Why? Because the back leg is stabilizing their pelvis. Mm -hmm. With people where this is like, it has to happen, you'll see a little bit of tailbone tuck even in a split stance. stance, So it's not common. That's why I I typically will recommend for most people, like most people watching this, there's a point where that happens. You can stop just short of that and you're probably below parallel. Like you're still probably doing a pretty damn good deep squat. And there's probably things you can work on That'll prevent that from happening. Things like working on stability, working on mobility of the hips and the ankles that typically will prevent this. The reason why this becomes a controversial thing is because you'll look at like Olympic lifters or advanced lifters and be like, see, it's totally fine. Yeah. Well, that's, a, I mean, that's a, that's a whole nother different class of, of human and skill right. where it isn't an issue. Um, just like with a deadlift, like some upper back rounding is totally fine. But for the average person, I'd say, well, let's try not to do that. But at some level, at high levels, and it starts to become kind of okay. Yeah, just to me, it matters if, if how excessive it is. I really do totally. think that there's, yeah. I've seen cases with clients where it moves and they're completely fine. Then I've seen other cases where it barely moves and it lights their low back on yeah. fire. So, I mean, it's kind of a feel your way through this. But it, it, your point, an easy fix. So I, when I know I'm not doing enough of my mobility work and I, and this is, because this is actually an issue of mine, right? So Um, because I already have a little bit of an excessive pelvic tilt. And then if I'm not addressing my mobility stuff, I'm not also working on my core strength and I'm lifting heavy, I'll have this slight movement at the bottom. I know it right away because, again, I'll start to feel it in my rectors. Mm. Like right away, I feel my rectors, which is telling me that there's a little bit of extension flexion going on uh, in my my, uh, lower back. And so then if I do that, I'll put squat shoes on. And when I put squat shoes on, there's I, it, it'll oh, yours all ankle, yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's all ankle. Because I'm not addressing my mobility, yeah. and when I'm not doing my mobility, and I go that, and I force myself to go that deep, it deviates. So normally, if you know, if you have that much of a wink, there's there's an there's an area of uh, in where you're not as mobile as you should be or can be that you can address to improve it. Well, this is one of those interesting ones because um, I know for. There's like different archetypal type of um, uh, positions that you have your body in terms of distribution of force. Like we know that like if we have these types of angles, like we can we can distribute the force a lot more appropriately and it's not going to rest too much in, you know, the joints or in the spine. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I do understand, you know, some coaches stopping preventing if, if they see that, like preventing them uh, from from depth in their squat until you know, let's say they they are working on, you know, a little more stabilized, like controlled uh, type of uh, uh, a movement there. Uh, but also, like if, if you're an experienced lifter and like you've worked your way through that and you have that ability and control, like I'm not going to sit here and harp on you right. for that. Yeah. Yeah. But if I'm a coach and I'm coaching you and like in depending on your level, like I'm going to address that that way. Yeah. Where this gets stupid is when you see the, the keyboard trainer warriors who see an Olympic lifter or some like advanced person. You get to- tailbone yeah. tuck. Or like, okay. Yeah. Just, just want to jump on That's it. That's totally different. Yep. Next question is from Randomly Randy. When your programs call for incline press, does the amount of incline matter much? It, it does. Traditionally, an incline is at about 45 degrees. Yeah, 30 to 45. 30 is to 45 I'd... is the range, but it's usually like most gyms, 45. Yeah, the ones that are in fixed a fixed position, yeah, like your yeah. barbell bench press. So a good rule of thumb is the higher the incline, so you go above 45, 50, 55, 60, the more the 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 more upper pec fibers you hit, the less of the rest of the chest you hit. The lower the incline, the more you're going to start hitting more mid chest and, and and lower chest. Uh, but I I mean, thirty to forty five is great for everybody. Now I've worked with people where 
they do better at a higher incline, more like 45 and people that work better with the 30, uh, like 30 degree incline. Like I've worked with people where 45 degree incline, it was hard for them to feel anything in their chest. It was all shoulder. So I move the incline down, you know, to 35 degrees or so. Then they feel it more um, in their chest. But whenever we call for an incline, it's what would be considered the traditional incline, which is usually around 45 degrees. So I mm. use 15 all the way up. Like I really do. And I think that um, there's value in if you always train, if you if your traditional thing is to always go to the fixed 45 degree right. bench and you've never lifted at a 30 degree angle, lift at a 30 degree angle. If you always do at the 30 or 45 sure. and you've never done 15, do 15. Like I, there's um, at that point, it becomes a little bit different of an exercise as far as how it's recruiting muscle and stuff like that. So. I think there's value in in moving uh, through all of those ranges of motion, depending on what you're what you're trying to yeah, do. Yeah, the chest mm -hmm. is unique muscle in that its attachments are uh, usually attachments are pretty close to each other, um, in the sense that like the bicep attaches at one point and the other. Even though those two heads are like the two heads are are attached at very close points, the chest has this one attachment here in the humerus, but then along the sternum and up in the up in the clavicle is like these all these attachments. So that means you can, I mean, pretty effectively kind of parse out parts of the chest by mm -hmm. changing the incline. A lot of exercises don't do this. Like I can't go upper, lower bicep or, right. but you with Most chest, exercise, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a big difference. But with chest, I mean, the incline, like what you said, Adam, like you're, you go from flat to fit to 10 to 15 to 20 and all the way up, like you're hitting different muscle yeah. fibers more intensely with different inclines. Right. So it makes more sense. Right. It's, it's almost like you're manipulating the strength curve in another exercise. It's right. Similar right. to that. So it's like, you know, there's value in, in going through that. So, but generic answer for when you see it in a program, we're typically saying 30 to 45 degrees. Next question is from Casey Diaz Smith. Is there a good and effective way to cut while not obsessively tracking calories or macros? Oh <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, look, uh, I'll tell you two right now. I'll rank them that will, you'll probably naturally cut your calories if you do one of these. And if you do both of them by five to 600 calories, just naturally. One is avoid heavily processed foods. The other one is to aim for one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Yeah. Like those two things alone, you're going to eat less. You're going to cut your calories naturally because yeah. your appetite will get crushed by doing those Target two things. Target drinking more water too. And I would add that in there. For, but those those are the, the biggest movers. Actually, I love that you said that. The So in this intro to this podcast, uh, we talked about what we're all doing. Like literally you just hit the things I'm doing right now. I am not tracking hardcore. I'm not even really tracking the protein. I'm aware that I'm hitting around a one-to-one. -one. Like, so I'm not like weighing, measuring. So you're making sure you get like 40, 50 grams per meal. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm making sure I'm hitting about 40 to 50 grams. I'm eating all whole natural foods, right? So cut out the processed foods and I'm drinking a lot more water. Those are like the main, and I'm leaning out right now, mm -hmm. nice and consistently right now and without in, any sort of heavy traffic uh, tracking and my body's changing. So I, I think that those are great, simple, easy things that if you just stick to that. And I'm also aware too. So like what, what will happen sometimes is let's say you got like a training session the day before that was a little more intense. You got after it. And today you had uh, leaner meats and things like that. And so you're at the end of the, towards the end of the night and you feel really hungry and you have, and you, and you may have what had happened, expended more than you did normally on a day the day before. And in addition to that, ate lower calorie. I'll allow myself to go have something. And this is an example where I would introduce like a pro a 30 gram a whey protein shake that's a hundred and something mm. calories and four and I'll let myself go get something to eat. I'll just make a healthy, good choice that's high in protein, minimal on the calorie side, and still eat without like being worried that I'm oh, this is gonna push me over. Yeah. Now just to give peace, people are always like, well, how much weight would I lose doing this? Like how big of a difference does this make? If you're a man and you do this consistently, so you're like avoid heavily processed foods, hit one gram of protein per pound of body weight, and you're a woman and you do this consistently, by the way, if you're more than 30 pounds overweight or so, you want to use lean body mass as your target for the for the grams of protein. But if you do this consistently, for the men, you'll fall somewhere between 12 to 16% body fat is where you're going to end up if you do this consistently. And for women, you're going to end up uh, probably around 21 to 23% body fat, maybe 20 to 23. So in other words, pretty healthy lean. So you'd never have to track. You'd never have to count macros except for the protein. You'd never have to track calories. Just doing this will get you to a relatively healthy, fit, lean body. Now it's not going to probably make you shredded. Shredded, you're going to have to start to track things for yeah. the most part because shredded 
is not necessarily where your normal, natural, healthy body wants to fall. A lot less some margin people, of error there. Yeah, and some people do. Some people, they'll just avoid heavily processed food, eat the protein, and they'll fall in the lower body fat percent range. But I've had so much success with clients with this when I trained everyday average people that this is what I did. After a while, I stopped having track of anything else. Just do this, and it worked like uh, magic. Next question is from Jackie018. What advice can you give family or inexperienced friends when searching for a good personal trainer? Are there certain things you guys would recommend asking or any red flags to watch out for? Oh, here's two huge red flags. Do you listen to Mind Pump? Yeah, that's a good one. That's <laughs> First a, one. That's a good I mean, it, it sounds a bit freaking uh, pretentious to say some shit like that, but I mean, we're no, I mean, the that's, show's large enough now yeah. that... And and we've penetrated the fitness space as far as gyms pretty well. Uh, most coaches, hopefully, have have heard or listened to the show. So I mean, that would be a one of the qualifications that I would ask for. I yeah. mean, as a generic one. Yeah, I, I would say besides that, because that's true. But I would say besides that one, um, if you work with them and your first session didn't involve an assessment. And your first workout beat the crap out of you. Those are massive, massive. Re if you show yeah. up and the trainer's never done an assessment, hey, cool, let's do our workout. And they take you through a workout, big red flag. And if you're done with your workout and you're like, oh my God, I got the crap beat out of me. I'm so sore. Wow, I'm exhausted. Most people would think that's a good thing. That is a terrible thing. That is like the biggest, biggest red flag uh, mm -hmm. right there. Other things to look for, I, you know, I hate to say this because now I'm going to cut out all the new trainers. But experience weighs a lot. Like if if I'm looking for a trainer for somebody that's in my family, uh, you know, I'm looking for a yeah. trainer that's been doing this consistently for yeah, like yeah. at least five years, ten years. I'm like, yes, like mm -hmm. this person has worked with a lot of people. Anyone, you know, like oh, I'm, you know, I've only been doing this for a year or two. You know, they'd have to be pretty exceptional um, for me to really right. Know, maybe that's family. what I would say. Maybe I tell my family member uh, either one, they you, I want them to have ten years of experience. Or two, that they listen to Mind Pump. Like that would be like the trade off. Yeah. Like, okay, if they have 10 years experience, but they don't listen to Mind Pump, that's fine because then they've probably learned on their journey and the, through trial and error of not being a great trainer for five years and then become a good trainer later on. Um, but I mean, I, what's tough to, how this is tough to answer this is because really what all, any of us would do is like, bring me what they gave you. <laughs> like, yeah, let me see, yeah. let me see what they gave you or what they told you. Yeah, and I, I can look, look at the, the content. Yeah. I can look at the programming and I can hear the advice they give nutritionally and know right away if that's a bad well, trainer. I'll tell not. you what I did. Yeah. I, I just hired my dad a trainer. I don't know if I told you guys, mm -hmm. I just hired my dad a trainer. So shout out to Matt uh, over at club sport. So I've been working out there for a while in the morning and I watch, uh, all the, the trainers that are there in the morning. I know there's other trainers that come at night, so I don't <laughs> see everybody, but I watch what they're doing because number one, I'm, I'm in fitness. So I, I always admire and see what's going on. And gen generally the trainers, they're all pretty damn good. They have a pretty high caliber of trainers at that facility. But this one guy really stood out for me because I watched him train men, women, older people, younger people, and he trained people very appropriately. And he was very patient and he was really good with form and technique. And he adjusted exercises when people said this kind of hurts here yeah. or this happens. He would educate people in between. He's also a competitive power lifter, meaning he knows how to turn it up when he needs to. So I've been watching this guy and he's super cool, super chill, really nice guy. And, uh, and I introduced myself and, um, talked to him and, and hired him for, to train uh, my yeah, dad. Yeah. Well, I think that's, I mean, I think you, you hit on, on a, a really important one, which is, you know, to observe and, and to really, um, instead of just like, screening through like a Google search or, um, you know, just asking like the, the manager, like which one's about, like to just go to the gym and, and observe for a while and watch how yeah. the uh, trainer and the clients interact and how many times the client is able to ask questions that then to the trainers able to give them a good answer for and, and really communicate that well. Um, and just be a fly in the wall and kind of see how that goes because you want to write, honestly, it's more about the dialogue and, and that communication more than anything uh, between the trainer and the client. And so to, to find that good match would be ideal. You know, we don't talk about this that often on the show. We don't push our, our private forum, but in our private forum, um, we have a lot of trainers, coaches, gym owners all over the country. And if there's not somebody potentially in there that could help your family member, they, they, might, know they might know someone. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's not a bad place. Yeah. If it's somebody who's really important to you, you're really wanting to make sure that you have somebody who you think will take care of them. And maybe you're away, you don't, you live far away and you can't go in and interview them yourself or whatever. 
Um, that forum is loaded with coaches and trainers all over the country, all over the world, but all over the country that potentially could uh, either have a referral or actually train them themselves. Mm -hmm. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides. Uh, we have guides that can help you with so many different fitness goals. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. Adam is at mindpumpadam. And I'm at mindpumpdestefano. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 